I do have a different thesis on how the human brain works. Uh, I came up with that when I was 14. I won, was one of the winners of this science contest, got to meet President Johnson. And, and basically the thesis is not one big neural net, but lots of little pattern recognizers each of which can recognize a pattern, and they're organized in a hierarchy, and we have about 300 million of them in, in the neocortex, which is part of our brain where we do our thinking. You've, you've made a nice analogy before that we're essentially expanding our neocortex beyond our biological constraints today. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Well, uh, I mean, these devices we carry around are brain extenders. Uh, they're not inside our bodies and brains yet, although actually there are computerized devices making their way in inside our body, but for the most part, they're close at hand. I had to take my bicycle across campus and show an ID to, to use the one computer that MIT had when I went to college. Now they're in our pockets and uh, they are brain extenders. I mean, who could do our work uh, or even get, get to work without these brain extenders uh, that we use all the time? Uh, they're, for the most part, making up for the weakness of human intelligence. We, you know, we can't remember a handful of phone numbers, and so we've always used technology to make up for our deficits. Uh, we are going to literally extend our neocortex. So as I mentioned, uh, and this, uh, when I came up with this 50 years ago, there was actually very little data from neuroscience to support it. Uh, my book, How to Create a Mind, has a tremendous amount of neurological neuroscience data that supports this thesis. And we can see these modules, and we can see there's about 300 million of them, and they organize themselves into a hierarchy. And uh, the neocortex, its hierarchical structure, uh, comes with mammals. It emerged 200 million years ago. Uh, a big step was taken 65 million years ago with the Cretaceous extinction event. There was a sudden violent change to the environment and it wiped out 75% of all the animal species, including the dinosaurs. And that's when mammals uh, reached their ascendancy and uh, that's when the neocortex really grew. Um, and then two million years ago, primates were in the ascendancy among mammals uh, and biological evolution to anthropomorphize said to itself, hmm, this neocortex is pretty good stuff. Uh, let's increase the enclosure to have more. So we developed these large foreheads in the frontal cortex. And up until recently, neuroscientists thought that that was qualitatively different, because we do qualitatively different things with it. Uh, we now realize it's actually was just an additional quantity of neocortex. And you remember what we did with it. We were already doing a good job of being primates. So we put it at the top of the neocortical hierarchy. And so the hierarchy got Bigger. And as you go up the hierarchy, things get more interesting. At the bottom of the hierarchy, I can tell that's a straight line. At the top of the hierarchy, I can tell, oh, that's funny, that's ironic, she's pretty. Uh, things get more abstract, more, more intelligent. Uh, that additional neocortex and that additional hierarchy was the enabling factor for us to invent language and music and art Every human culture we've ever discovered has music. No primate culture has music. Uh, that came from that additional neocortex. So to uh, refer to the point you just made, we are going to extend our neocortex in the 2030s. Uh, I mean, we're already creating synthetic neocortex. That's what my team here at Google is doing, creating a hierarchical structure uh, that is similar to our understanding of how the neocortex works. We're going to increase our neocortex, and if we look at uh, the implications of that in the past, uh, the beings like primates and other mammals that just don't, that have a neocortex, but don't have the capacity that we have, uh, really can't even begin to appreciate what we appreciate. They don't understand music, and you could never explain it to them. They just don't have the neocortical capacity. The resources here are extraordinary. Street View is probably the most beautiful example of that, uh, but there's all kinds of data, and that is a key thing we need. We can't understand the world without having the information about it. And uh, AI is, is quite remarkable. We can really... 
uh, gain deep insights. I mean, it's really pretty amazing. For example, uh, Alpha Zero uh, looks at a board and can actually figure out the right moves. And it's not using the old technique of saying, well, if I go here, then he'll go here, and then I can go here, and doing this move, kind of move trees, which is the old technique. It actually just looks at the board and sees deeply into the patterns. It's not obvious that that would work, but, uh, but it does. The other factor that's making deep learning working, work is what I call the law of accelerating returns, which is the exponential growth of information technology, both its capacity and its price performance. And that's a whole other story. I started studying this in the 80s and saw that, for example, the price performance of computing calculations per second per constant dollar was a perfect double exponential going back to the 1890 uh, American census. And people say, oh yeah, well that's Moore's law. Well, Moore's law is just a small piece of that because this started decades before Gordon Moore was born. And we're already going, and Moore's law is the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. We're not already now into the sixth paradigm, which is three-dimensional computing. And it's not just computing, it applies to anything having to do with information. So the computers and the memory and all the uh, resources we need and the data are all growing exponentially. They're roughly doubling every year. Uh, and that means multiplying by a thousand in a decade. You made an observation in one of your books. You pointed out that um, there's the potential for this being a self-fulfilling prophecy when organizations wake up, which they rarely do, and recognize that progress is being accomplished on an exponential scale as opposed to a linear one. And I believe you cited Intel as being an example where they said, we're going to double our processing power every year. But to some extent, it was simply setting their sights on that objective that may have helped them accomplish these great things. Well, that industry, the semiconductor industry, not just Intel, uh, did recognize this, and they had a, an official roadmap, which went out like 20 years, uh, which definitely had this exponential uh, progression baked in. And so all of these uh, semiconductor companies planned on that, uh, we can see that now with the uh, neural net boards, like the TPUs that, that Google is creating. They're coming out on a regular basis and are exponentially more powerful. It's pretty empowering when an industry can acknowledge that they're on that type of trajectory instead of a linear one. But as you point out, it's not in human nature to be able to anticipate that your advancements will be much more rapid in the future than they were before. Well, exactly. I mean, our intuition about the future is linear and not exponential. The kind of problems we had when our brains were evolving 100,000 years ago were linear ones. We'd track an animal in the field and go, oh, we're going to meet at that rock. That's not a good idea. I'll take a different path. Uh, that became hardwired in our brains, which is a linear expectation. We didn't expect that animal to speed up as it went along. We made a linear prediction. And the primary difference between myself and my critics is we're looking at the same world and they just op think it's obvious to take a linear projection from that. Uh, and it's even unsaid. Uh, our intuition about the future is linear. Uh, so I make these exponential projections. It's, it's remarkable how accurate it is, particularly when you talk about price performance and capacity and not just computation, even like biology with genetic sequencing and also modeling and simulating and reprogramming our outdated software. All of these are uh, exponential progressions. That first genome cost a billion dollars, we're now down to a thousand dollars. And there's many other examples of this. And it's also going to overtake resources we don't normally think of as information products like food and clothing. We're going to print those out on three-dimensional Printers in the 2020s and food we're going to produce with vertical agriculture controlled by AI and we're going to print out most of the things we need, including modules to snap together a house. I should uh, point out that he's generally right with these predictions. Like, what is it, 89% of the time? 86%. Okay, 86. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you Google Kurzweil, how my predictions are faring, uh, you'll get a 150-page paper analyzing 147 predictions I made in the Age of Spiritual Machines, which came out in 1999, about the year 2009, and 86% were correct within one year. And so, some of the ones, uh, the ones that were incorrect were just off by a few more years, like we would have self-driving cars. That was wrong. 
had I said, you know, 2014 or something, that would have been correct. Can I dig into something you said a second ago? Yeah. We're talking about this, this uh, accelerating returns, and something that comes to mind is that most industries fail to have that vision really 10 or 20 years out because they're thinking linearly as opposed to exponentially. And, you know, to some extent, I feel like 360 imaging is kind of that linear path today. We, there are really, really exciting technologies on the horizon, light field imaging, uh, VR, AR, but the industry is really embracing 360 imaging because it's something we can wrap our heads around. We feel like it's safe. We can add it to Facebook. We can add it to YouTube. We can do this in the next few years what can actually be accomplished in the next 10 years that's not incremental gains on resolution, but really, you know, pretty transformative advancements in the field. Do you have any advice for us? Well, uh, you mentioned VR and AR, uh, and there was a false start to that. And I've written about the life cycle of technologies, and uh, very often there are visionaries that see the, revol the radical potential of a new uh, technology. Uh, but even exponentials are not instantaneous. So this looks like a young group, so you may not remember the internet craze of the 1990s. And if you had the uh, website address dog.com, you were a billionaire. Uh, and, and then around the year 2000, the financial community said, no, wait a second, you can't really make money on these internet companies. And we had the internet crash that almost took down the world economy. Then it came back when it really had the price performance. So we have little internet companies, you know, like Google and Apple and Microsoft that are worth trillions together. Um, same thing will happen in, with VR and AR. Uh, we, did, we have not had the price performance, the resolution, the ease of use. Uh, the devices are cumbersome. We don't quite have the bandwidth. We don't have the content. So a lot of things were missing, just like with the internet. Uh, the, the vision that this would revolutionize the world was correct, but it wasn't there in the 1990s. And, it, and VR and AR is not really there yet in terms of all of these parameters. Uh, we will have all those key parameters in the 2020s. The devices will be much more elegant. People don't want to you know, look like Darth Vader uh, when they're using a device. Uh, they'll be I, in I do. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but that's a small niche market. That's so. true. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, 2020 is that that will take off, and something like Street View, which is trying to give you a full immersive experience about the real world, uh, enable you to be anywhere. And uh, so VR and AR is, I think, an ideal way to deliver that kind of content. There was a presentation made that talked about uh, the sort of future maps experiences that we're showing where you can lift up your phone and it will localize your current camera field of view against existing street view imagery to give you uh, a, a sense of the direction that you're pointing. Yeah. I'm not gonna go into any great detail on <coughs> the specifics of what that future holds, but that's real insight, right? That's actual valuable utility for people. And, and you know, thinking about how we can help people understand not just the direction they're pointed, but What's a quarter mile over there? What's it look like from above me? Like the, there's, there's real insight that will empower us to that earlier point about abstraction. We're, we're going to create profound ways of communicating profound new artistic creations that we can't even imagine. So Ray, it was a real pleasure to have you out speaking with us this yeah. morning. Thank, Thank you, you very it's much. It's great to be here.